Hello. We follow our AGM with a range of presentations to help people with their knowledge and understanding of HSP. After each talk, the presenters are happy to take questions from the audience. In 2020, we ran these presentations virtually, and this video is a selection of the questions asked, mostly through the Zoom chat pane. You can find a link to the presentation itself in the comments below. And I'd like to give thanks once again to those presenters for taking the time to talk to us and then to answer all of the questions asked. Enjoy! Is HSP always hereditary or where there is no family history going back many generations, can a new gene mutation start the condition in a family? HSP is not always inherited. Quite commonly, an individual may develop HSP with no family history whatsoever. And quite often, we can't find a single genetic change that's responsible for HSP. So it is often what we call a monogenic disease. That is where one particular gene change can be transmitted through families. But quite often, the broader genetic makeup of an individual or other factors as well that are not genetic can all combine together to create somebody to developing HSP. And that, those types of HSP are not inherited in the same way. They're not inherited typically. Would you be able to diagnose and assess different mutations with a single biomarker? So that's our goal, that if we had a biomarker, instead of looking for the specific change in the gene, we'd recognize a biomarker signature, which is this signature abnormality in, in the fat processing pathway within the cell that would mean that instead of knowing the specific spelling change in the gene that a patient has and, and relating that to whether they have HSP or not, we could look directly in their blood and say, actually, you've got that specific signature problem with your uh, fat processing pathway. This demonstrates that you have HSP regardless of the different spelling change that you have in the gene. Now, I should say that we're at a very, very early stage in this process. With HSP affecting fat processing pathways, does diet have an impact? I think that's one of the big questions that we'd like to answer. Not that we're aware of at the moment is the simple answer. The first thing to do is to understand which fat processing pathways are involved and which type of HSPs relate to those fat processing pathways. And once we can separate those things apart, we can look then more carefully at those types of HSP and at those individuals to understand better how fat processing in general in their body is affected or, or relates to this. There are many fat processing pathways which all interrelate, which work also very independently of each other. So it's very much unknown at the moment. Someone asked saying they've seen a couple of studies where people with HSP 5A are being given statins. Is that something that you're trialing or might help? We're not. Um, again, because we don't have enough information yet to understand if and how the fat processing pathways are specifically involved. And then what, once, we, once we have clearer knowledge of that, then we can look at potential treatments and use the cell models that we mentioned that Emma talked about towards the end of our talk. So again, it's just too early to tell. We don't have any evidence that if you have high levels of cholesterol and you have HSP, that your symptoms are going to get worse or progress more quickly. The way that we manage the cholesterol levels in our blood is different to the way that we manage the cholesterols inside of our cell. We use that word all the time. You say, I've got a high cholesterol, I've got a, a low cholesterol, but you'll know if you've been to the GP and had a cholesterol test, there's lots of different bits of cholesterol that they look at. And the cholesterol inside our cells is different yet again and even more complicated. So I want to make a really clear distinction between the blood test you'd have at the doctor saying I've got a high cholesterol, I'm at risk of heart disease from the cholesterols that Andrew and I are looking at inside of cells. We don't have any direct evidence of that direct link between those in the majority of people who have HSP. The important message I want people to go away with, though, is I wouldn't want people to start saying to their doctor, I need to go on a statin if they've got nothing wrong with the cholesterol in their blood or to be worried about that becoming a problem for them or, or what they're eating directly becoming an issue for how their disease might progress. If gene editing is successful, do we presume that it could halt degeneration occurring, but could it reverse any damage that's already been done? So gene editing is a technique that's created great excitement. 
but actually the way gene editing is used is in the lab we can typically for example grow cells in culture and then we can use the gene editing technique to go inside one specific cell and we can alter the reading of that gene and then you can grow those cells and all of those cells will have that same spelling alteration in them so what we're doing in the lab in Exeter is to deactivate some of the HSP genes in brain-like cells that we grow and then we can look using the techniques that we talked about that we've developed that we talked about in our talk we can look at how the fat processing pathways are altered by those gene alterations in those cells but gene editing can't be used in our bodies so we're, we're made of billions of billions of cells and there isn't a way to go inside of our bodies and alter or correct if that's the right word, any of the alterations that any of us may have. So gene editing really is a, a very powerful tool in the lab, a technique for studying genes, but it's not something really that we can use in the clinic, for example, to try to alter somebody's DNA. I just want to ask, I mean, I've been diagnosed with SBG7. I've noticed on one of his charts, uh, mitochondrial functions, um, it was mentioned there as paraplegic gene. And what does that actually mean? In spastic paraplegia, historically, most of the HSP genes were called for spastic paraplegia SPG, and then they were numbered numerically as they were discovered, and then they were found too thick and fast for the numbering system to be kept up with, and so that kind of system fell apart. So SPG7 is one of the earlier genes that we identified, spastic paraplegia 7, but the actual protein it makes is called paraplegin, and different proteins in our bodies work in different parts of the cell. Some proteins work in the skin, the membrane of the cell. Other proteins are part of the scaffolding that give the shape of the cell its structure and hold its shape very carefully together. Other proteins move things around. There are literally thousands and thousands of really complex biological processes going on at any one time in any one cell. And one of the parts of the cell which is important for energy production is the mitochondria. But it isn't just important for energy. So it's literally a compartment of the cell and paraplegin works within that compartment. So the paraplegin is the name of the protein and it works inside this compartment of the cell called the mitochondrion. And the mitochondrion is a special compartment important for energy production, but also for many other what we call metabolic functions inside the cell as well. It's a privilege to be working with you. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your days. Lovely. Thank you very much. And then we'll call that a wrap. Thanks very much, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.